Hi, and welcome back to a uh, legislative update with our state representative, Tisha Buss, uh, state representative for Woodstock, Plymouth, and Reading. And um, Tisha has been joining us uh, every other week during the legislative session. I'm Patrick Cody from Okemo Valley TV today, sitting in for Tom Ayers, the senior staff writer for Vermont Standard. This is uh, done in collaboration with the Vermont Standard and also Woodstock Community TV. So, Tesha, thank you for joining us once again. And uh, how are you doing today? We're oh, thanks. thanks for having me, Patrick. I'm mm -hmm. doing well. Recording this on Monday. Uh, this is the week, uh, just starting the new week after the town meeting break. Mm -hmm. um, and it's probably a lot to discuss. And uh, you head back to the state house tomorrow, correct? After a week off? I do. And this week will be the final week for policy um, bills to go through before crossover. So everything that the House Education Committee or any House bill is working on, um, it has to be passed over to the Senate this week or it dies this legislative session. And same for the Senate. So they send bills over to us. We'll work on their bills next. And there will be a little bit of tweaking that we can do back and forth and maybe some small things that we can add to a Senate's committee bill or something. But um, all major bills will have to be on the floor and voted on this week if we want them to um, have a life. And in terms of the bills that you're working on in house education, which ones do you feel most strongly about that that uh, will uh, have the most likely to have a life after this? Yes, um, there's two bills. Um, one is called the Board of Cooperative Educational Services, and the other one is our school construction aid. Um, it'll be a working group, and then we're also working on some master planning grants. So this is really important, the master planning grants particularly, because what we're actually asking school districts to do for the first time is to present a master plan of the entire supervisory union. So every building in the union, when we received back the estimate of the construction need in the state for our schools, it totals over 6 billion. That is billion with a B. It's such an astronomical number. And we also recognize that this is coming at a time when we have the federal aid money from COVID is, is basically dried up. And while everyone says that the economy is doing well and the stock market is doing pretty well, we don't actually see that on the ground in with Vermonters. Um, when I when I go around and I talk to people, people are struggling. And so what we have to look at is if we're going to put more state aid out for school construction, which we absolutely have to do, that money does have to come from somewhere. And where is that funding source? And how do we find a funding source that doesn't hurt our average Vermonter? That is what is of critical importance to me. And we will not be able to decide that this legislative session. There are too many moving components. We have to, first of all, find that revenue source. Um, we have to study that with the Joint Fiscal Office. That's the office of, you know, they assist us in all the financial modeling that we do um, to support the bills in the legislature. We'll do that in conjunction with the Agency of Education. They will also run their numbers. We have a new finance director, uh, chief financial officer, and she has come in during this incredibly challenging time and her mind and her capacity are extraordinary. Um, the Agency of Education is, has really been, it was really beat up in, in the recession. Not only did we stop school construction aid, but we gutted the Agency of Education, um, basically about a 50% drop. And so what we keep asking is for them to do the work of, of many more people. And it's it's hard. But she is a clear demonstration of, of how when someone is really, really good, um, it gives the legislature the, the amount of information that we need to make better decisions. So I'm really glad to see her there. We will have a working group this summer that will decide what kind of governance do we need? So, you know, you're a school 
um, you're a district and all right, like take um, take our supervisory union. We've got Killington Elementary, Woodstock Elementary. There's um, Pittsfield and then Reading. And we have to look at all of those facilities, not just our junior high and high school, also um, the Pomfret School for the fifth and sixth graders. And we have to create a whole plan as to what's the state of all the buildings and what is going to need to happen in terms of maintaining those buildings, because there might be small or smaller, you know, million and two million dollar projects as opposed to a whole new school. And then there are just we've we've done a huge amount of consolidation in our district, but there are other districts that have multiple elementary schools within 10 miles of one another, and they're going to have to look at their total construction costs. They're also going to have to look at how many teachers they employ. We have heard testimony that, you know, there'll be seven elementary schools close by to one another, and they don't have enough staffing to keep one of them open. So they'll close it temporarily for, let's say, a week while some teacher is out on vacation or out sick, and then they combine. And what they're learning is when they're combining, they're saving tons and tons of money. Um, we have administration costs that get um, reduced. You know, Act 46 reduced some of our supervisory, our like high executive level positions, but it didn't address our teacher and support staff level positions. And with the decline in the number of people in Vermont, we are going to need to look at that. And we're also just going to need to look at how do we save money? We can't only find a revenue source. We also have to make some strategic um, choices that will also save a lot of money. There is an elementary school that if it merged with the elementary school that's a couple miles down the road, they would not have to spend any more money to absorb those kids because there's such a few amount of money. There, it's like such a few, there's such a few amount of kids they can be absorbed in every classroom level. So there are going to be really hard choices like that that we're going to have to address. We're going to be looking at vetting um, contractors uh, for the design and construction and the clerk of the works that are going to be needed for every huge construction project that we do. We have to look at how much we can spend each year sustainably and have to maintain our bonding capacity at the state level and support our municipal levels as well. So we don't want to tread too quickly towards this goal because we don't want to we don't want to make promises that we can't keep and we have to be we have to be smarter than ever because we have less resources um than ever maybe not than ever because I haven't been in the legislature long enough to be able to say that but it seems that they're very precious regardless of how little or, or larger they have been um, in the past. And so there will also be a look back. We recognize that we can't, we can't stand up a school construction aid program tomorrow. And there are school buildings that needed help years ago. And so the number that is being continuously floated is five years. And they will have to meet the standards that we will set forth in obtaining school construction aid. And, you know, one thing I got to praise our supervisory union for doing is when they submitted everything to the Agency of Education, um, they absolutely said it was impressive. And the things that we're asking for um, from supervisory unions in this master planning, um, that those those measures have been largely hit. Um, there's always going to be some fluctuation in looking at enrollment and the size of a school. The overall cost, the overall square footage to kid ratio is very complicated based on the types of programs that each school uses. And it's also complicated by the fact that we need an excessively larger amount of individual spaces to work one-on-one -on -one 
with kids that require special education services or mental health um, concerns and, and needs. So that's the other reason why renovation is not always the most positive track. And also we have to look at, is it worth putting kids in swing space for three years, meaning trailers out in the parking lot, um, no gym space, you know, there, there's a cost to saving as well. And we have to look at that for every school. And so right now that index for other states has been 65%. Once your building reaches 65% of its natural life, then it's not typically worth it because it doesn't solve all of the problems. Um, sorry, my kitty cat. <laughs> <laughs> the cameo. That took I know, I know. He really wants to be on film. <laughs> um, so that... These are these are things that we have to look at. Um, you know, we we have safety issues. You know, the state's on the hook for active shooter drills and and those types of concerns as well. And if if we've got long hallways and we can't shut down certain parts of the building, that is a huge liability for all of our children. And we we cannot dump millions and millions and millions of dollars into a school that doesn't make any effort or can't make effort towards its school safety needs um, in a renovation project versus a new build. So all these things have to be really thought of um, carefully and there'll be a working group that'll, uh, uh, it'll be a legislative working group um, so that we can start to craft the language so that we're further along. When, when we receive a, um, a task force recommendation list, we have to then take testimony on all of that list translate it into a bill, legislation, and statute, and get it passed. And that's a really tall order in the six weeks that we typically have to do that before crossover, amongst the other items that we need to address as a committee. And so if we do a legislative working group in the summer, we can get we can get further along faster. And um so do, is your sense, I mean, was not just the um, the school bond um, vote failing in the Mountain Views district for Woodstock Union Middle High School, uh, but th there was also um, several others statewide that failed. Do you sense that there was a, a um, well, I guess it's a two part question. <laughs> uh, uh, is, would that come as a surprise? And how do you feel that that will impact the work going forward? Is, will this accelerate some of that work at all on the school construction specifically? Yes. Well, we had school budgets just fail. Mm -hmm. um, most right, people, in addition to the, yeah, the school construction. Yeah, exactly. Projects, right? I think our larger concern is that we know that school construction aid will come online. What we cannot uh, solve outside of school, con well, there's the school construction aid bucket. That has um, that has a solution to it that I think is, we'll reinstate that program, we'll find a revenue source and we'll be putting out 20, 30, 40% towards schools and that'll help bonds pass. Then there's the 30% of budgets that failed. 30% of those budgets failed because we have a $17 million increase. That's an increase only in healthcare. So what we're doing across the board is um, we're looking at the bargaining process for how we um, purchase in like in bulk that healthcare. We're looking at the prescription drug package that comes along with that, trying to figure out how we can get that more affordable. There's another thing called reference-based pricing that we're looking at, which means, and we've seen other states model this, um, you go, uh, there's like a 33% increase in, in all sorts of procedures that are really, really traditional. Think colonoscopies and mammograms and, and, um, those types of treatments. Well, you go into one hospital, it's $500. You go into another hospital, a colonoscopy is $1,500. Reference-based pricing would say, for this healthcare plan, we're paying $750. We're paying the middle of the road for this procedure. And that's it. That type of savings 
for the number of teachers that we have, which is around 32,000 teachers, would save approximately $17 million a year. And we can do the same thing for our municipal employees. We can do the same thing for the State Employees Association. So if we can start to make this type of change across the board, now that everyone is utilizing healthcare in a more preventative way, which is should be saving us down the road, but maybe we just haven't caught up to those savings yet. I mean, I don't study healthcare enough because I'm not in that committee to know the ins and outs, and I'm not even for sure that they do also. But that's something we're doing. The healthcare committee is looking at re removing prior authorizations because we removed them during COVID and we saved a ton of money. Um, UVM has over 70 employees that just deal with prior authorizations. I mean, it would stand to reason that if you took them away, um, even if you increase the cost of some things, um, you're saving 70 employees. Um, you could be putting them to other, you know, places and uses. Um, we have the issue of mental health. We used to have around 127 mental health professionals in, in schools. Now we have over 700. So that cost is on the education fund. Um, the folks that work outside of the education fund that actually work in the mental health field, um, they have the ability to say to the school, sorry, we don't have enough people, so we can't help that child. And the school doesn't have that. They are federally obligated to take care of a kid from the minute they arrive at school until the minute that they leave. And so that puts more money on the backs of property taxes. So the amount of money that we spend may not be different moving forward, but it may not be felt so acutely on our property taxes. And so that's what we're really working on. The other bill that will come out of house education that will help overall education spending that I'm really excited about, and I get to be the bill presenter because I've done a lot of uh, heavy lifting on this bill, which I'm really, it's great. It's called the Board of Cooperative Educational Services. We are only one of, um, there's only nine states that don't have an established Board of Cooperative Education Services. We call that BOCES, that's the acronym. And this will allow us to do bulk purchasing um, for goods and services. So if we want to do um, scientific-based literacy and we need to do coaching across the whole district, that cost our district $670,000 in the last two years. Okay, but the district right next door wants to do the same thing. But they're also starting from scratch. They haven't done any research. They don't know the curriculum. They didn't get their, they didn't have a somebody that, learned how to do the coaching program and then come and coach all of our teachers, they're going to have to start from scratch. That's going to be so much more expensive than them saying, hey, can we pay you a fee? And then you can just do that for our district since you already know how to do it. And then more districts join on and more districts join on. And guess what? The price of everything just went down because we have so many more people doing it. And if we're going to allow six of these to be created across the state so we can have re ge like geographical representation. And it's also great for special education. So let's say a student shows up and they they cannot be in the classroom. They need a, a placement that is outside the classroom for a year, year and a half. They need to learn some skills. They need to learn emotional regulation. Um, so right now, a state place student, usually it's around $60,000 a year. It's another $30,000 to transport that kid. So that's $90,000 a year for one child. If they go out of state, 200,000 is the average cost. Per sometimes kid. the state play per kid. And sometimes the state place kids have to relocate because it's a residential program in Brattleboro, for instance. So what we did in our district is we did create a collaborative and it is allowed right now. This is creating a system that would be more plug and play for, for and, and be more encouraging. And it forces every supervisory union to consider a collaboration. We collaborate with Hartford. Those students, it's about 15 to 20 students a year. That includes, uh, we have one teacher and one paraeducator. It's about $15,000 a year per student, and that includes transportation. That is just one demonstration of us having almost an entire 
15 kids for the same amount as we would get send one kid out of state. So if we have to start looking at pooling resources so that it doesn't cost so much. We will have to have an executive director um, of each BOCES. So there will be six administrators that we will pay, but they will be different because they will be very business minded and savvy because their job will be to just expose as many different districts to what this one is doing really well. And you can be a member of only one, but you can buy services from any. So if Chittenden County decides, well, we're going to do a federal grant writer, um, which is a really complicated and challenging um, type of grant. Any federal grant is 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 so much harder than state grants. Then we can all just pay a fee for service and say, write this grant for us. Um, and that'll be far less expensive than us hiring it alone. So we have a lot of, I, I feel really proud about those two bills in particular, because I feel like it is the first step to addressing a lot of our financial concerns. And um, and I think it's going to help relieve some stress from districts um, that are really struggling, coming up with everything on their own. Right. So. Uh, I'm actually, yeah, sort of surprised that doesn't exist on some level now. Um, it, but that's a, it sounds like a hub and spoke um, sort of model for a membership organization. Yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's a bill that's being that you're presenting uh, next week. It should or be this coming ASAP. Week. Yes, <laughs> we have to. It has to go through appropriations, but um, we already have some money that was unused last year. Um, for the the task force on school construction, and um, we that task force really really got stunted by the flooding, and by the huge number of people that were on it. So it hardly used any of its money. So it will be able to do the startup grants. It's ten thousand dollars is the estimate that we have found to start up a, a BOCES. Um, to cover legal fees for the agreement that has to be created um, between the districts that collaborate. So it's not an expensive um, stand up of, a, of the program. And then the rest will go to the school construction uh, task force. So since we don't ask for new money, we just ask for money that's already um, basically in like a savings account to be allocated differently. Um, we should be able to fly through appropriations and get to the floor. Great. Um, and with the this under this model, would that fall under the administration of the agency of education or would it be fully independent? So the board of the BOCES would be independent. It would have to be approved, but basically that's just to make sure that there's um, geographical representation across the state. Um, but, and that they, that every cooperative has met some minimum requirements that we set forth in the bill. Mm -hmm but it is a pretty straightforward um, startup agreement. Like I've started up, uh, you know, several school nonprofit type of situations and and it's very similar to what you would have to do if you started up a daycare essentially or any nonprofit. So it should be really easy uh, to be able to meet those standards. Um, and then they basically are governed by the individual school boards. So the budget of the BOCES every year and financial statements, quarterly financial statements goes back to the, the school that basically, you know, bought the service from the BOCES. And then they have to always show that why it is uh, financially not only sustainable, but that it, ha it has saved money um, from the district doing it itself. So that is the legislative intent, which is very important. All right. Well, we'll look forward to hearing... Uh about that some more after you've presented it. And um, I guess that's probably gonna be a wrap for today. Uh, we appreciate you for taking the time uh, before you head back to the state house this week after your town meeting break and filling us in on on uh, what's to come. I know, as you say, it'll be an intense week. So we wish you the best for that. And hopefully we'll uh, we'll get you back in, in a couple weeks. Excellent. Thanks so much, Patrick. All right, thanks again. Okay.